So can you all read the uh, text over there? So I'm going to talk about the micro uh, molecular fluids, or there's another name called polymeric uh, fluids. Uh, this kind of fluids basically can physically you can identify in two different forms. So one is if you have a polymers, for example, dissolved in solvent. If you have already studied chemistry, you know what solvent means. Uh, sometimes the simple solvent may be just water. Okay, you dissolve something in the water. Okay, but that something has very large molecule. So we call that micromolecule. And also you, you need to have another kind, it's called the polymer melts. This is even easier to understand. For example, if you wear a pants made of polyester, and if you happen to run into the uh, unfortunate situation where the temperature is very high in the area, and then you may see your pants may get burned, there may be holes on it. And, uh, you know, during the burning process, there will be liquid created. Now, those liquids are called melt. So melt is really the polymeric liquid uh, material at high temperature, where it becomes molten material. So it's called melt. And uh, among those two materials, there's one kind which is very interesting, where the molecules are very large, and the molecules can form some kind of order. And uh, then this kind of order we call liquid crystal order or phase. So let me ask you this question, uh, because I went to college, uh, high school uh, in the 70s. And uh, at that time, when I studied physics, uh, general physics, elementary physics, I was told uh, there are uh, three phases for matter in the world. One is a gas, the other one is liquid, and then there's a solid. And let me ask you, is that true in your textbook or you, you know more phase of matters? Do you know anything besides gas, liquid, and solid? Plasma. What else? Well, liquid crystal is, we can call another phase, but this phase is not liquid nor a solid. It's a phase in between. Okay, so we will come to this in more details later on. And you're going to find out by exploring these properties, we can manufacture all kinds of uh, high-performance materials. And then lately, there are a new class of materials which is completely made by human being. It's called the polymer clay nanocomposites. I guess you all heard about the word nano science, nanotechnology, and this is one of the very important application of a nanoscience and technology, that is you combine a polymer with a nano-sized particle and then you can manufacture all kinds of fascinating materials. But today I'm not going to talk about this because this is uh, uh, too much for one hour, but I will focus on liquid crystal polymers. So in the daily life, uh, the materials where you can, uh, uh, on daily basis, uh, experience probably uh, if you go to McDonald's, you know, you buy hamburger, they give you the ketchup, and uh, ketchup is one kind of uh, micromolecular material because this kind of material, if you put it, you know, it's not like water wool, you know, come down immediately, it will very very slowly coming down. And shampoo is another example where you have a solution mixed with something which is very big in the molecular size and uh, therefore they can do something. For example, can get dirt from your hair and uh, also, you know, uh, you can use shampoo to, uh, when it's not shampoo, it's detergent. It's, you know, if you look at them, they all look very similar to wash your clothes. You can drive the dirt out of your clothes. And the soap. Right, soap, if you put a soap bar in a uh, bathtub for a long time, you're going to see bubbles, right? If you 
stir them in the bubbles, and then the this this solution becomes kind of a slippery, and that's also micro because of the micromolecules and gel. You know, uh, I have not seen much much here in in, in U.S. A lot of the uh, ethnic minorities they put you know they make their hair look very very exotic, and they put gel on their head, and that's another kind of materials and jam. You know, uh, you eat, you buy in grocery stores, and glues. Glues you use in school to glue papers together. You know, you can find all kinds of stuff, uh, which all have these similar features. And uh, and then you can summarize. In you know, all this, looks like sticky. Indeed, you know, the compact fluids most of the time are very sticky. The stickiness comes from the larger molecules. Because large molecules is not like small molecules, they can move around easily. Because they are too large, you can you can compare in a a mouse with elephant. You can see which one runs faster uh, or, or more uh, you know uh, 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 swiftly in uh, uh, you know emergency cases. You can find that it must be mouse. Okay, same same situation here. So when we say micromolecules, and basically if you look at the micromolecule under microscope, they roughly look like this. This is a cartoon, by the way, it's not a real molecule. Uh, you have a small part we call monomer, and then between the monomers there is some chemical bond. This is called a hydrogen bond. If you study physics, you know there is an electrostatic force. Now for monomers, between normal, normal, uh, no, normal uh, monomers, I'm sorry, uh, there are electrostatic forces, and those forces bind them together because they're so close, their size is very small. They normally is less than one nanometer. So because they're so close, therefore electrostatic force becomes so strong. And this kind of forces create a very, very strong bond between monomers. And in in a uh, micromolecule, normally you have like, like hundreds of thousands of monomers bonded by the chemical bond, we call hydrogen bond. So mathematically, uh, we cannot deal with that detailed structure for micromolecules. So therefore, we try to simplify. For example, we may introduce a, a thread which is, you know, floppy, or we call that flexible. Uh, or we can, we can introduce a thread with some branches. I mean, all this can happen in macromolecules. Macromolecule is not necessary to be a, a only a, a thread. It may have a branches or multiple branches. Okay? So mathematically, you can model them using uh, one thread or one thread with many, you know, branch, or you can model them using cross-linked networks where you have threads connected and at the, at the junction where uh, you have the, the two threads meet and uh, there you have a monomer where it's bounded by the uh, chemical bond. Or for some other uh, micromolecules, they really acted as a rod okay? because their bonding is so strong. So they, they cannot move away from one another easily. So they all move like a rigid object. So therefore you may see like rigid rod molecules, or on the other side, uh, on, on the other side you may have something that they are packed so compactly, therefore they act as a disk. So we call those, you know, discotic micromolecules. And in some other cases you may have each section which is very rigid, but then it's connected by somehow floppy, you know, spacers. So you, you, you're going to see all kinds of configurations for micromolecules or polymers. So next I want to show you some phenomena where uh, experimentally they find it very interesting. Scientifically, they find this is a really the distinctive features of this micromolecular fluids from other fluid you are familiar with, like water, air, things like that. So the first one is called a rod climbing phenomenon. So if you put glue, for example, you can do the experiment at home. Okay? You put the glue into a beaker, 
and then you put the uh, water into another glass, and then you put a rotating rod into each one of them, and in the glass where you have water, and you don't see anything, you see a dimple develops around the rotating rod. But in the beaker where you have the glue, you're going to see glue climb along the rod. The faster you rotate, the higher the glue climbs. You can do experiment using uh, eggs. Uh, my daughter, she's in uh, elementary school. Uh, she did one science fair project uh, early uh, last year. And she just took some picture of, uh, of, uh, of water versus egg. Indeed, you see the climbing, but for glue, you can see more significant climbing. So this is called a rod climbing phenomenon. And why, why you have this thing climb on a rod? Well, think about if you try to stir a micromolecule which is very long and not that rigid, uh, not that uh, uh, mobile, if you try to stir them and then they, their motion to one direction is going to be faster than to the other. So the force generated to one direction versus to the other is, is going to be different. The force difference is called the force normal stress difference. And this difference will, will be just like if you have a bubble gum, for example, you try to squeeze it. You're not, going to disappear, you're, you're not going to make the bubble gum disappear, you're going to make this flatter, right? Because you squeeze it, and then they cannot go into this direction in which you are squeezing, they have to expand in the other direction. Now here is the same. You do this, and then there will be a force trying to push them perpendicular to the rod. And therefore they have no place to go. The downward is the, the bath of the macromolecular liquid, and on the top is air, they can only move up into the air. So that's the reason why you see this uh, rod climbing phenomenon. Okay? So the key is, there is a f pressure or stress difference which forces this kind of material go upward. So therefore this material look, you know, behaves like a rubber. And for rubber, there's another name, it's called elastic material. Because they, they, they have this uh, property where you squeeze them, you release, somehow they go back a little bit. So they have this elastic memory. Now the second one is another uh, hallmark of this micromolecular fluid. That is, if you try to pull the liquids out of a capillary tube, capillary tube, I mean the Radius must be very small because the radius is too large, you don't see this. Okay? If you put the liquid or squeeze the liquid out, on the left is the water. You squeeze water out of the capillary, you don't see anything happen. Whatever radius you have, the water just come out at the same, almost at the same radius. But on the right is a micromolecular fluid, it's a polymer fluid. You see, when you squeeze them out, they expand and sometimes they expand significantly. So for example, if your uh, capillary tube radius is one millimeter, the expansion could go to uh, four millimeters or even larger. Okay, so this is called an extruded swell. The polymer tend to swell. Why polymer swells? Well, because the liquid is elastic. So within the capillary has been squeezed so tightly, there's no place to, to, to expand. When they come out to the free space or the air, they can expand. So therefore, they expand. Okay? So there's an elasticity in it. And the third one is called the tubeless sea foam. Uh, I guess you all, all know this phenomenon. If you deal with the liquid, right, if you have a uh, the fish tank, you want to change the water, how do you do? You know, you use a, flop, a floppy tube, you try to suck some water out, and then the water will flow automatically. So this is called a seafoam phenomenon. Now here, you can do it without a tube. So it's called a tubeless seafoam. What that means is, you first, you, of course, you don't use your mouth to suck, in this case, you use some pump, okay? So you pump the polymer liquid into the uh, capillary tube. And then you can put the tube upward, 
far away from the surface of the polymer, and then the liquid is still going up. So you don't need, in, in the middle part, you can see there's no tube, but the liquid is still keep going up. Okay, it's a very fascinating phenomenon. You don't see that in water, or any other or oil, things like that, because they are not polymeric materials. So this one, I brought a sample with me. Uh, so the, this is the comparison of two gas bubbles in the liquid. On the right, on the left, your left, uh, is a bubble in water. For example, you put a, a gas bubble in water, and then they're going to rise in the water. And then you're going to see there's a, a cusp at the bottom. Okay, there's a tip at the bottom. On the right is a gas bubble in polymeric liquids. You don't see a cusp, you see a flat edge. Actually, if you see from the other direction, you see a cusp, but you see in this direction is a, a edge. And uh, this is a characteristic of polymeric liquids. So here is an easy experiment I can do, I can afford to do, that is, if you have this, you turn it upside down, you see the, uh, the uh, gas bubble coming up. And then you do see that the uh, white edge, you know, is trailing the gas bubble. Okay. Maybe you can uh, look at this. This is very easy, you know, to do. If you have any, uh, you know, full uh, shampoo bottle, and then uh, you can turn it upside down, and then you see gas bubble rising up. You always see this phenomenon. So right now, there's some research group in the world, they try to using this as a tool to measure the property of the material. So by analyzing the shape, and then they can, you know, uh, find out what property the material may have. So next, I want to focus today, the focus is on liquid crystal polymer. And here are their uh, architectures. So for liquid crystal polymer, it's a little bit different. All the monomers are packed very tightly, so more or less they behave like a rod or a slightly bending rod. Of course, this is not exactly true. In reality, they have some flexibility, but uh, that flexibility normally is negligibly small, therefore we can you know, care less about it when we do mathematical modeling. Or there are some, uh, in, the, in the second type, you see a, 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 a curved a molecule, and uh, this is called the semi-flexible molecule. This is the hardest thing to model. So far, there is not good uh, theory about it, because you have this uh, semi-flexibility, so mathematical study becomes very, very complex. Or the last one uh, is a little bit easier, where you have uh, rigid segment connected by floppy, uh, floppy spacers. So here is the question I asked you at the beginning. Uh, I asked you about how many phases material have you, but you told me four, and uh, this is one phase. Uh, it's called the liquid crystalline phase. So this phase is between liquid and solid. So what is a liquid phase? Does anyone know what is the liquid phase? How do you characterize the liquid phase versus the solid phase? Well, for the solid phase, each molecule is so well positioned. So you have what they call the full symmetry or lattice structures. So the molecule cannot you know, move relative to, to, be, to the other molecules easily, okay? But in the liquid phase, the molecules can freely move around. So therefore, they don't have any fixed distance between any two of them. Their distance will vary in time and space. And if you have a phase between these two, then you can imagine what kind of phase they can be. So for example, if we use the rigid molecule as our model, so each line segment over there represents a rigid micromolecule. And uh, if, 
you align them like this, then you have the crystal we call solid phase, because they are so well aligned. Okay. And in the other extreme, their orientation or alignment is random. You see their orientation, you cannot tell me which way they prefer to align them. So this is called the isotropic material. And then in between, this is called liquid crystal phase. Where, roughly speaking, if you look at the center of each rod, you don't see anything. If you remove the rod, you only leave the center over there. They are center still, you know, distributed randomly. But collectively, you do see each rod is roughly aligned to, to, to the direction going up and down, right? So this is called a partial order, and this is what we call, also call mesophase, M-E-S-O, mesophase. And for liquid crystal, there are two kinds. One is, we call lyotropic liquid crystal, where you dissolve your polymer into, into the solution, and the other one is called a thermotropic liquid crystal, where you heat the solid polymer so that they form this mesophase in certain range of temperature. But if you heat it more, you lose this phase because everything at high temperature becomes random, completely random. So here are some examples. There are so far, I think, is between 30 and 50 liquid crystal phases being discovered by physicists material scientists, chemists. So here are some phases I want to show you. So this is what we call nematic phase, the simplest liquid crystal phase. Uh, this is what we call smectic phase. So the difference between the nematic phase and the smectic phase is in the nematic phase, the rod roughly align, you know, upside, up and down direction. And in smectic phase, looks like they form layers, layered structures. And then, of course, discotics. Discotic can also form nematic phase. So I will come back to this a uh, little bit later. And then there's another one called the cholesterics. I think you all uh, use or have maybe uh, seen the uh, display devices made of liquid crystals, like uh, the one you know, on my computer, and right now you can buy TVs at high price, it's also called LCD TVs, which are all made of liquid crystals. They are made of liquid crystals of cholesterics and nematics. I'm going to show you how they work. And this is called a somatic C phase. Now this phase is different from A in that uh, you see, each rod is a little bit tilted. It's not completely, you know, uh, perpendicular to the layers. Or there's another phase where you have all the discotics, uh, you know, uh, lined up together, form a, a, a column, so this is a columnar phase. So today I'm going to focus on only nematics and the cholesterics because they are the simplest phases uh, which have been studied most successfully. The other phases, we still have, you know, trouble to fully understand them and uh, write down the mathematical models. So here are some examples in daily life where you can quantify as dynamic phase. So this is a picture taken in some place in China, and everybody is riding a bicycle. So you look at, they all going to one direction. Uh, I wish. Uh, the picture is, is a little bit more clearer. Uh, you can see, uh, if you look at their bicycle directions, roughly they all going from the left to the right. So therefore, this is one phase. If you look at this from the top, far away from you know, each individual, you do see this, what we call, nematic phase. And this is another case. If you open a cigar box, so these are the cigars, where they all aligned perfectly to one direction. So that's what we call perfectly aligned nematic phase, right? So each cigar is one rod. 
And uh, if you look at the, uh, this probably is a Coca-Cola uh, Coca uh, bottle shelf. And uh, you can see this is a perfect semantic A face. So you do see a lot of uh, these faces in your daily life. And this is another one. This was taken sometime back in the 1920s in New York, where you see the construction workers sitting on the frame of a, a, a skyscraper. And uh, this is a A face as well. See? I mean, within each level, you see all the construction workers you know, standing over there, and then they form these layered structures. Now, here is another picture I uh, downloaded from a website, a uh, liquid crystal research website in Germany. Uh, of course, this is an artistic picture where you see the fishes flying in sky, in space, and also you see the fish falling on the floor. And you look, if you look at the fish flying in the, uh, in the air, you don't see any order. But if you, do, if you look at the fishes uh, lying on the, on the floor, you do see some kind of order. So this is, what, this is what we call the phase transition. So in the air, you have the uh, randomly oriented fish. We call that isotropic phase, because there's no preferred directions. But on the floor, this is called the nematic phase because they can only align on the floor. There are certain preference to certain directions. They can only align, you know, horizontally. Uh, there's another picture uh, I, I, I skip because it's artistic, but I'm not sure about the law in Singapore. Uh, there's some nudity in it, so I, I delete it. That's the semantic C phase. Now this is a discardic phase, where if you look at the water crest in the water, and uh, you look at each leaves flowing on the water, and if you imagine each leaf represent a discardic polymer, and then they form a nematic phase, because they're normal. If you look at the leaf, leaf is a surface. It's the normal of the surface is all pointing upward, right? So this is another case of nematic phase. DNA. Everybody knows DNA has these double helical structures. And if you put a lot of DNA together, you, you can see the cholesteric phase, where you have orientations uh, of each segment horizontally, and then in the vertical direction, you have these helical structures going upward. And this kind of structure is very generic in nature. Uh, you know, Nature is the best teacher to, to, to uh, uh, our mankind. So uh, nature has already, uh, you know, have all kinds of amazing structures there. Us just try to, you know, try to understand why nature created those kind of structures. So this is natural structures for DNA. Okay, when we study this, for example, when experimentalists study this uh, materials, how do they do? Well, they use a device called uh, Rheometers. Now this device can measure many things. can measure uh, the forces, the pressures, stress, and also viscosities. So I don't want to get into detail. This I know this is a kind of technical for you, but I just want, to, uh, want you to, to, uh, to aware that there are some specialized equipment which are used to study the mechanics of these materials. There are also optical devices where you can use X-ray, uh, NMRI and the optical, just uh, you know, uh, uh, visible light devices where you can look through the uh, uh, light transmission and other uh, microscopic structures. So I'm going to skip this. This is a little more uh, technical, but I will briefly comment. This material is really, really different. If you put, say, one blob of your glue between two glasses. You try to slide your one glass, you know, uh, on top of the other, and then you're going to see this thing can slide much easier than you put regular liquid. Okay, so this is called a shear thinning behavior, which means the the stronger you shear them, the smaller the viscosity is, so the easier the the place will slide, you know, uh, uh, between. 
each other, and also there's a normal stress difference, which is non-zero. That's why you see the rock climbing phenomenon. And there are also uh, very beautiful structures form, light structures, uh, I'm going to show you later. If you uh, put this material under certain temperature, after a while, you will see beautiful, beautiful patterns form. And then you can just visibly see those patterns. So therefore, there are some artistic products are made of liquid crystal uh, structures. And of course, there is phase transition. This is very important for physicists. So the applications, basically that's the main part of this talk, uh, because I'm not quite sure how much mathematics I can, uh, I can tell you today. Uh, so I try to just uh, uh, bring your attention to the application side of this material, and then mention very briefly about uh, modeling effort in the end. Uh, liquid crystal has many, many applications. The most easily understood application is the liquid crystal display devices, we call LCD device. And uh, nowadays, uh, LCD devices has jumped from a uh, uh, display uh, monitor of the laptop computers to desktops now, uh, go to large screen uh, TVs. But I guess if you go to electronic stores, you don't see very large screen LCD TV yet. That's because it's not easy to manufacture large size materials without, you know, over, without uh, uh, to uh, overcome the difficulties. For example, if it's too large, if you view from different angles, you're going to see distortions. Uh, that's one thing you don't want to see. And uh, there are many other applications I'm going to point out today which you don't see in your daily life uh, is the high performance material. And this is the most important application of liquid crystal polymers. So this is liquid crystal displays. Uh, you see this everywhere. You see this on the road, you see this you know, at home, and also you see this on your uh, wrist. Because I see a lot of people wear this, uh, you know, uh, electronic type of watch, and you see the digital uh, 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 showing of the numbers. Those are all due to this effect. It's, it's called a liquid crystal uh, uh, display. And how this thing works? So this is how you make this work. Your first liquid crystal is liquid. It's, it's a liquid material, so you, you, you inject liquid material into a, a cell. And then the bonding part of the cell are glass layers. Of course, it's not the real glass, sometimes it's a really composite material. And then you put the uh, polarizer, you put the... Okay, it's kind of slow. Uh, so you, you, coat, you coat the glass in the interior by conductors, very thin. And then you put the polarizers on top and on the bottom. Okay. But on the top and the bottom is, trans, is perpendicular. The polarizers are, are trans, perpendicular to, to, to each other. So we call this uh, crossed polarizers. So that means if you have a light, coming into the top, it will not be able to trans, uh, 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 transmit through the second one because they are, they are perpendicular to each other. Okay. So you can see the arrows pointing to the you know, polarization of light in one direction, and on the bottom is in the uh, orthogonal direction. So this is how this device is, uh, is made of. But then I want to show you how it works. So it works like this. So if you don't put any voltage onto this device, uh, all the liquid crystals, molecules, larger molecules, uh, rod-like molecules are relaxed. So they lie on top of each other, okay? And then when your light is shining through on the top, and it cannot penetrate on the bottom because the bottom is, 
is cross polarized. So in this case, there is no light transmission. So on the other hand, if you turn the voltage on, okay, if you turn the voltage on, and uh, you're going to align the molecule on the top in one direction, and on the bottom in the uh, cross direction, or we call it perpendicular direction, and then you have a twist of your orientation of molecules. And then when the light transmits on the top, it also follows this pattern, and therefore the light can this time can penetrate the bottom one as well, because the bottom one, or the molecule orient with the uh, polarizer's direction. So this time light transmitted. So this is the one way you can uh, you can design the liquid crystal uh, uh, devices. And of course, you need a light source. You need to have a light shining through so that they can transmit through this. And this can be made into a, you know just like a poker sized display or even larger. And uh, and then you can see you can watch TV in the future on the uh, uh, piece of paper. Then I mean it's very small and flexible. And also this has been uh, uh, tried to uh, manufacture this kind of material so that they can bring this to into the space where they want to manufacture what they call foldable mirror. You know because this this thing can you know change the light transmission. So they want to create a mirror in the space which can be brought up by the space shuttle and if you, you know if you have a rigid mirror you cannot do it right space shuttle is very small can only probably house like a, a few a few astronauts but you want to have a huge mirror then you have to fold the mirror bring it into the sky and unfold it there and then that can you know reflect certain light back on earth so this is the, in, in the NASA's mission uh, I, 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 I heard about this many years ago, and right now they can, they can already uh, manufacture uh, this kind of foldable mirrors with a uh, uh, relatively small size, you know, for example, like a several uh, meter by meter size, that's not a problem. But even larger ones, still they have a problem because in the space, if you unfold it, it's, it's very difficult. Okay? You may destroy the material in that case. But, but this, this shows you you can manufacture a very small device where you can use as a TV and the screen is flexible or you can manufacture a very large device using the same kind of mechanism where uh, we showed you before. And lately there are some uh, new technology is called a polymer dispersed liquid crystal. The problem with only liquid crystal is it's unstable which means uh, after a long time, your, your quality of display becomes worse and worse. So therefore, they tend to stabilize the material. Because you can imagine you have an all liquid between two glass, glasses, the liquid is not that stable. So, so therefore, the, the property of the molecules can, uh, what they call, uh, degrade. And they come up with some idea that is, okay, let's just put another polymer into this liquid crystal. So when the other polymer becomes solid, then they create a small capsule. Within each capsule, you have this liquid crystal. So this is called a liquid, a polymer dispersed liquid crystal. And then if you apply electric for an electric field, and then in each capsule, you have this liquid crystal, then it still can play the role of display devices. Okay? So normally in this case, they put uh, like 20% volume weight of polymers into the crystal to stabilize it. So here is a picture, uh, uh, an exper experimental picture where you see the droplet of liquid crystals and the dark areas are the solid polymers. And here's how it works. So imagine each capsule is a sphere and then within the sphere you have this uh, liquid crystal. And normally, if you don't apply any electric field, the molecule will orient based on uh, the nature, so which is called the minimum energy state. Okay? 
nature always gives you the state where you have minimum energy. And there's different kinds, de depends on how the liquid, liquid phase interacts with the polymer surroundings. So in the first case, you have what we call the radial orientation, where all the molecules, because they are small rod, and then they, uh, they, uh, they stick to the surface, then they form this radial form. And in the second case, uh, all the molecules on the surface of the sphere is in a tangential direction, oriented in a tangential direction, and interiorly they orient in accordingly to avoid any conflict. And then in the third case is another state where you have this uh, almost like, you know, uh, vertical, uh, vertical orientation of, a polymer, of the liquid crystal polymer molecule with the uh, sphere. So the number one on the left and the number three on the right are two different states of the same, what we call anchoring condition at the boundary, and the middle one is different one. So the middle one is called a tangential anchoring, and the other two are called a normal anchoring. And this is how it works. Uh, so on the left picture, I mean, you have this uh, droplet, or we call this capsules, where each one just uh, randomly oriented, you know, based on the, uh, the, uh, the uh, minimum energy principle. On the right, if you apply electric field, they all orient to one direction. So this tells you you can use electric field to alter the orientation of, of the molecules within each cell or each droplet. So therefore, this material now has been used in uh, LCD displays. Most of the recent LCD displays are made of this kind of polymer dispersed LC, uh, LCD devices. And this is another new technology. It's called a polymer stabilized cholesteric liquid crystals. So this time, for example, we use cholesterics. Cholesterics is nomadic where you have a orientation along a fixed direction in a helical fashion. So you look at the picture on the left, when there's no field, uh, all the molecules orient from the bottom to the top in a rotational fashion. But if you apply the field uh, uh, slightly, and then you see the structure is destroyed. If you apply the field strongly, you see they all, all the molecules all align to one direction. So these devices is better than the previous one I showed you, but they're all using the same mechanism. And this is going to be the next generation of LCD device uh, because this principle uh, was uh, only uh, discovered uh, not far long ago, probably a few years ago, in the Lake Crystal Institute in the Kent State University. And here is a, a, uh, a, a visual picture of what we call the defect structures. So you see regions of, of, of liquid crystal where you have well aligned and then you have a, a dark lines between them. The dark lines are the area where you have, you have randomly alignment. So that area is called the defect area. And uh, using this, sometimes you can create beautiful pictures, visual pictures. Maybe you can call this abstract art. All right, so this is the, uh, another application is called a Kevlar. Uh, I don't know how many of you know about a company in the U.S. called the DuPont Company, DuPont Chemical, which is a very known, is a uh, huge international company. Uh, this company manufactured this material. Uh, they dominate the world market, which means uh, all this small company has been, you know, squeezed out of the market by them. And this is a very, very uh, strong material. So this material is 20 times stronger than steels. As you can imagine, 20 times steel is very strong. This is 20 times stronger. So this material has been used in, uh, for example, here I showed you something, uh, police forces in the US, because US is not like Singapore. Uh, there's lots of crimes. So fighting crime is a very important job for the uh, uh, police force there. And they wear, for example, their uniform, their vest, they wear vest in, inside. 
because otherwise there may be uh, criminals stab them or you know shoot at them. And also you can see the bars in the uh, prison are made of Kevlar's because they're so strong they cannot even cut it. And here basically tell you what kind of uh, you know criminal weapons which can be protected using Kevlar product. The knives, uh, handguns, no problem. If you use those devices, uh, you won't hurt the uh, uh, police officer because they wear the vest so strong, your knife will not penetrate, your bullet from handgun will not be able to penetrate either. However, if you say I bring a cannon, of course cannon can still kill. And uh, in the middle, in the uh, Air Force, uh, this material has been used for manufacturing the aircraft parts. The reason is they are so strong, but they are not that heavy like metal, like steel. And you can see most application in the military is on the soldier itself. See, the soldiers, the U.S. soldiers, you know, uh, they invaded uh, Iraq uh, last year or the year before, I forgot, you know, I'm still living in 2004. Uh, so, you see, their casualty is very low so far. Uh, probably only a uh, little bit more than 1,000 soldiers has been killed. The reason is all the soldiers are well protected. They are well protected from the top to the bottom. From the top, from the helmet is made of Kevlar. The vest, the uniforms are made of Kevlar. Their shoes are made of Kevlar. So this is their vest. It's called the interceptor vest. Uh, you can also put some protective layers in it. So you see lots of pocket. You know, if you really want to, you can go to some military uh, uh, st uh, shops. You know, USA there are military what's called disposal shops where you can buy all kinds of military devices you know from uniform to uh, you know uh, even use the jeeps whatever you, you name it and you can you can see this is very safe okay? so please and especially soldiers are aware of this on the battlefield you can see Iraq is very hot if you look at the, the uh, television all the soldiers wear you know very heavy you know protecting gears so that's because in, inside they all wear this kind of a vest Helmet, as I said, this is a, a much better than the uh, 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 steel part. They call steel part. Previously, if you look at the, the soldiers that wear very heavy steel part helmet, now they have been replaced by lightweight Kevlar helmet. And also inside their uh, uh, vehicle, this personnel carrier, inside they put a layer of they call uh, small layers. You know, it's like, it's like a liner to the vehicle uh, made of Kevlar. Because if you shoot at the vehicle, you may be able to penetrate the metal exteriorly, but you're going to have another layer of resistance, which is made of Kevlar. Okay? So you see this cabinet over here, uh, that's made of Kevlar. And here's a list of applications uh, in the military, uh, from explosive audience disposal suits, you know, where if you See, there's a bomb alert, alert and then you bring in special force to, to disarm the, the, the bomb and then the, the, the guys all, all wear a very bulky suit and that are made of Kevlar and also BASIC, that, that means you know, everything soldiers wear and uh, all, lots of parts are made of Kevlar the shoes they wear are made of Kevlar okay? and gloves made of Kevlar you can see you have not seen people wear a steel glove, right? I mean, steel is so rigid you cannot bend your fingers. But the Kevlar is flexible. And here is a picture of the underwater uh, device where the U.S. Navy using Kevlar cable to stabilize some sonar devices, uh, you know, in the Pacific. Uh, normally, this these cables are like. As, as I said here, 20 times stronger than steel and also there's no rusty issues here because steel you're going to get rust, you have salt water and then steel is going to get rusted but for Kevlar there's no uh, rusty issue so it's, it's resistance to this kind of uh, uh, 
problem. And sales. So this kind of sales you can you know sell at speed like 40 miles per hour. That's roughly about 100 kilometers per hour uh, without uh, you know bending much or breaking them. So it's very strong. So this has been developed in the 60s, but even so far, it's not completely understood why this thing is so strong. And if we really can understand this, probably we can manufacture even stronger material. So that's the reason why we need to have theoretical studies. You may say, okay, if we have already manufactured, why would we need to study? The reason is you need to understand. And then beyond that, you want to you want to push the envelope to see, based on the same principle, can we make even better materials? So here's a little cartoon which tells you why Kevlar works. So imagine Kevlar molecules, which is liquid crystal molecules, are made up of monomers, and then you know the links between monomers are the chemical bond we call uh, the hydrogen bond. So for Kevlar, the the molecular composition is very special. So they have this structure, they have 14 carbon atoms, have a two nitrogen atoms, two oxygen atoms, and 10 hydrogen atoms. So they, they bond together in that form, form the monomer. Okay? And when you have a uh, monomer, and then you would say, okay, uh, how those uh, uh, molecules align. So for example, if you put molecules like this, you know, randomly, or you put molecules like that, uh, almost aligned to one direction. I guess it's easy to see the second picture, probably give you better strength if you put them all together, right? So this means you have certain alignment. So this kind of alignment is called a crystallinity. And this is very important. If you don't have this crystallinity and you have randomly aligned molecule, even though your molecule is very strong, but when you put them together collectively, they are not strong enough. Okay? But on the other hand, if everything aligns to the same direction, each one is strong, collectively they are even stronger. So here are some, some examples where you, you see the comparison between Kevlar's and others. So on the top is the Kevlar monomer structure. And uh, this is like uh, uh, breaking strength is, is between 20 and 30 uh, uh, grams per veneer. It doesn't, um, I don't think you should bother with the, uh, the units. Just say the, the larger the number is on the right column, the stronger the, 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 uh, the monomer is. And then the second one is rayon, which is one uh, man-made material. Uh, some of you probably wear clothes made of that. And also you see nylon. You know nylon, you know, make uh, those uh, clothes and especially panty houses, things like that. And then there's a, a, a fourth one, uh, Nomax. So you can see, compare these four, they have different uh, molecular structures in, within each monomer, and the Kevlar is the strongest. It is strongest is because Kevlar molecule, uh, in terms of monomer, is consists of these two parts. The first part is called the uh, aromatic group, and the other one is called the ami group. If you combine these two together, you, you, you normally create very strong uh, bindings between them. So here is the comparison between water and uh, Kevlar. This is a smaller picture where you have one oxygen, two hydrogen, that's water. And, and the water, Molecules, uh, items are also uh, 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 created by binding one oxygen items with the two hydrogen items. The reason they bind is because one is a slightly positive, uh, carry a positive charge. The other one is slightly carrying the negative charge, right? So when they, when you have a positive charge and meet a negative charge, they tend to attract to each other. So this is an electrostatic force. And when they are so close, this kind of a force is very strong. I don't know whether or not you have already learned the Coulomb law in electromagnetic theory, where the force between the two charged particles 
is, a propor is inversely proportional to the distance between them. So when the distance becomes so small, you can see the force is tremendously strong. So is that kind of force bind the atoms together to form the molecule? Now here the same on the right is the uh, uh, Kevlar molecules. So I'll, I'll skip this. So basically, the strong, the strength of the Kevlar molecule is due to the binding at the monomer level. Okay. They bind very strongly, so therefore the, the, the polymer molecule becomes very strong. And on top of that, they align to certain directions, so collectively they become even stronger. Okay, so this is the second class of materials called the Vectran. Vectran is, is manufactured by Salonese Corporation, uh, which used to be based in the U.S. and uh, Germany. And uh, I was consultant for this company for a couple of years, and uh, uh, somehow the textile industry shifted to the Asia Asian area, and then the, the, they closed many uh, factories and the research facilities in the U.S. So this is another, another amazing material. This is the melt, the other one is the solution. So for example, fiber optics. You all know fiber optics, right? Now if you, uh, you know, make a telephone call, most of the telephone calls uh, go through the undersea uh, cables, and some of them are optical fibers. And uh, Vectron has been used to manufacture these optical fibers. They are very strong and also they have very good optical properties where you can have uh, light transmitted very fast. And also you can use this to manufacture uh, strings, for example, tennis racket or uh, some other rec uh, recreational uh, equipment, uh, fishing poles, fishing, uh, uh, what is it called, wires. And this is the landing cushion used on the Mars uh, mission. You all heard about the Mars mission. They send a aircraft to the Mars, then they have to land it on the Mars. But if you have a hard landing, the whole equipment is going to be destroyed. So they create this, this, uh, this uh, a balloon type of uh, cushion so that uh, you put the, uh, the uh, uh, what was called the uh, rollover, is that the name called rollover? You put that the rollover inside it, and then you drop it. You let it land on the Mars, then it bounces several times and gradually settle down and then open up. Okay? But if your material is not strong enough, if the rock will punch a hole on the, on, the, uh, on the cushion, and then the effect is not there, so your equipment may be damaged. So this thing is very strong, so therefore, you know, when it bounces several times on the rock, on the mountains, there's no problem. And even, you know, bouncing from the cliff is not a big deal. And uh, also it can make very strong thread you know, uh, to, to weave even thicker uh, ropes of fibers. So here's a list of applications of electron. Both are commercial materials these days, but their theoretical understanding is not that great at this point. So this is another uh, uh, fashionable, you know, uh, Amenity probably can enjoy in the near future. You know, your, your windows are switchable. Uh, so that means, you know, if you, if you hit one button, your window is completely transparent. If you switch it, you know, uh, on, it's completely opaque. So this is, this is because you put the liquid crystal inside the window. So therefore, you know, when the electricity is off, you have transparent window, and then when it's on, you have a completely opaque window. Uh, I don't know, maybe this thing can be uh, very appealing to someone. Uh, instead of, uh, you know, put a curtain inside your house, now you don't need curtain anymore. Okay. It's all built into your window. So here's a beautiful picture of the defect. So if you put a liquid crystal material and then you drop a few debris in, inside it, then you're going to see the, the formation of a defect because the debris is going to destroy the orientation at that point. And then there will be a very beautiful pattern form due to the orientation change. So here comes the math part.
there are many models. Uh, I can't think of any but this one because this one is a little bit simpler looking. Uh, <laughs> but still, you have to use differential equations, derivatives. Have you learned derivatives before? No? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, this is the, the best I can do because otherwise uh, any, any model of this physical phenomenon involving derivatives. Okay. Derivative is kind of a rate. It's a rate of change of, of quantity about time and space. So in, in more advanced mathematics, what you do is you try to relate the rates together because you cannot model the physical quantity directly. But on the other hand, you may be able to come up with a relationship among the rates. Now those relationship is based on some physical principles. Uh, for example, you all know velocity, right? Have you learned velocity? Velocity is the uh, displacement traveled divided by time, right? But in reality, you know you cannot measure displacement. It's not easy to measure displacement. For example, you want to measure the displacement from here to another country, you have to, you know, travel very far. But you can always measure velocity very easily. You can let your car or whatever, say, uh, start it at one point, then you move in very short time, and then you can always measure this displacement. And then you divide it by time traveled, you know, from, from the first point to the second point. Then you get the velocity. So many times measuring rates are much easier than measuring the physical quantity. So that's why we have to use a derivative. Velocity is a derivative in that sense. <coughs> So here's a, 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 a differential equation which tell you the, uh, I'm sorry, I, I found a typo here. <clears throat> but the first one is supposed to be, uh, uh, this is d d t, it's a time, it's a time rate of change of the function f is equal to <coughs> spatial change of uh, function f about the space m. So I'm not going to go into any details here, just show you <coughs> This is the simplest model I can put up, put together for you uh, without telling you the details. <laughs> and the next I want to show you, okay, with that model, how can I tell you my, my, my molecular orientation? Okay. So the F is called a probability. F is a variable tell you at the time t in the m direction what's the probability, what's the possibility of a molecule will be in that direction. So we form this what we call the tensor uh, product. Uh, it doesn't matter, I mean for you, you don't need to worry about the terminology. And then you only need to know that this quantity can be geometrically be visualized as the ellipsoid. I hope you all know what ellipsoid is. Okay. And uh, for ellipsoid, you have three axes. Do you know ellipsoid? <coughs> ellipse. How about ellipse? Do you know ellipse? Okay. Let's just talk about the two-dimensional object, ellipse. So the one I, I, uh, I plotted there is ellipse, actually. F so for ellipse, you have two axes. Right? You have one, uh, what we call the longer sine axis, the other one is the shorter sine axis. So if you can distinguish it between the longer one from the shorter one, then you, we, we see that the orientation is roughly along the longer one. Now you generalize the, this to three-dimensional space, you have uh, ellipsoid. Okay? That's three-dimensional generalization of ellipse. Okay? So here we're going to do in the, the ellipse. So if we do everything in two-dimensional space, of course that's not true, right? In our real world, we live in three-dimensional space. So everything has to be modeled at 3D, but if you don't know ellipsoid, we can imagine this all 2D. So we live in the 2D world, okay? Everything, orientation is in two-dimensional space. And then we're, we're going to model this kind of experiment. 
you put the liquid crystal between two uh, transparent glass and then you slide one gla glass relative to the other. So this is called a shear flow experiment. So this is one of the fundamental experiments. So we want to see what happens if we put a liquid crystal material between the two moving plates. Well, here is what you see. If you slide them, you know, very fast, and then there's nothing happen. They all roughly align to the flow direction. We call that direction the flow direction. So they kind of tilted a little bit. Okay, they don't, you know, parallel to that direction. They tilt a little bit. Okay. But if you don't slide them that fast, you see something very interesting. So here's a, a mathematical solution we plot. Okay, so this time uh, I have to tell you which direction is the flow direction. Flow direction coming out of this screen. So this direction is the flow direction. Okay, and then you see uh, uh, the, the right curves I plotted are the tips of my uh, ellipse. Okay. So, so you have ellipse, you know, rotating like that and like that, you have a pair, one on top and the other one on the bottom. So this is a mathematical solution, it's not a physical solution. In a physical solution, you, can only, you only see one. You either see the top one or you see the bottom one. Okay, it depends on where you begin with. But mathematically, we have what we call two family of solutions. So they rotate like this. It's like doing kayaking. If you know, uh, if you ever, you know, go on to a canoe trip, you have to roll the bow and then that's called a kayaking motion. So this is what we call kayaking solutions. Basically you see, you know, uh, your solution just, uh, you know, periodically doing things like that. Okay. That means you have a molecular oscillations in the, in the liquid. And here's another picture, uh, uh, in uh, for a different family, if you shear at a slightly, you know, uh, uh, stronger uh, uh, strength or speed, but it's not that strong, and then your kayaking solution becomes not that small, but a very wild oscillation. So two solutions combine for one, and you see they rotate like that. Okay, so that's your flow direction. You see, you know, molecules just keep doing this constantly in the flow. And uh, if you increase the speed a little more, you see this phenomenon, where it looks like you have two solutions, one on the right, the other one is on the left. But then this, the solution just uh, rotate here for a while, then jump here, and then come back again. This is called a chaotic solution. I, I, I guess you all heard about this word chaos. And this is the real example of a chaotic solution. Uh, so what chaos is, means is, you don't find any period, but you do see, it seems like they, they almost form a period, and then suddenly they leave that, jump to another place, and then almost form a period, then go back, go away. So this kind of a, 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 a randomness, I should say, is characterized by chaos. Of course, there is some mathematical measure which will tell you what chaos really is. So here is another cartoon where you see uh, how the molecules rotate in the flows. Okay, you just look at the, the picture on the right hand side where they have rotations and come out and then almost form a almost vertical and then suddenly they collapse and then rotate again. So that's, that's the mess I want to talk to you, but of course I know this may be a little bit over your head. Uh, but if that's the case, uh, please excuse me because that's the, that's the model we, we, we can come up with for this. We don't have any model which is simpler without using differential equations at this point. So let me just briefly uh, summarize what I have been uh, talking about in the past uh, uh, 60 minutes. So we have demonstrated the usefulness of high performance material. Uh, this material is very useful. And, uh, and also we have find mathematical models. However, the model right now is still primitive. In the sense that we can capture certain phenomena quantitative, uh, qual qualitatively, but not quantitatively. So what that means is, 
if you ex in experimental setup, you can see many phenomena. Our theory can predict those phenomena, but not at the same parameter range. Okay? So it's a little slightly off. So therefore, we need to come up with better mathematical theory, mathematical models to really say, okay, give me your experimental data. I put into my mathematical model, and I can predict exactly the same thing. But that's not the case at this point. So there are a lot of challenges ahead. Both experimentally, there's still some phenomenon has not been explored, and theoretically. Okay, so even nowadays, we still can find you know, theoretical predictions which has not been experimentally validated. So there's a lot of uh, you know, work left you know, uh, in this area. So that needs a lot of uh, new faces, new ideas, uh, especially younger people to get involved so that we can push the science, push technology, and uh, hopefully we can make a better understanding of the future and make better materials. Thank you very much for your attention. Do you have any questions? Carlos, any questions for Professor Wang? I guess maybe it's too, uh, too overwhelming to you. Uh, I guess I should give you some tutorial before <laughs> we get into these details. Because I know that this is a very eye, uh, really eye-enriching uh, opening talk for us, right? and also an enriching talk for us. So please join me to thank Professor Wang once again. On behalf of RBS, I would like to present a token of appreciation to Professor Wang.